This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Today I'd like to talk about something called the Cayley Dixon construction or how to naturally build the sequence of algebras starting at the real numbers and then going through the complex numbers, the quaternions, the octonions, the sidonians, and so on and so forth. And some of you may be familiar with these algebras. So it's known that the complex numbers is a field, that is, it's commutative and associative, and everything has inverses, and so on and so forth. The quaternions are something called a division ring, which is essentially a non-commutative field, but it's still associative. It's well known that the octonians are non-associative, but they are alternative, which is like as close to associative as you can get without being associative. Here, everything has an inverse, and there are no zero divisors. So I've got a whole video on zero divisors if you'd like to check that out. The Sidonians are not an alternative algebra, but everything still has an inverse, but there are also zero divisors. That kind of thing is impossible from here to the left, but it's totally possible from the Sidonians to the right. And to the right here, you always get zero divisors, even though everything has an inverse, and you only get something called power associativity. But that's really kind of like a big view of what's going on. What I really want to do today is look at the details of this construction. So in order to do that, I'd like to say that under everything, each of these is equipped with something called a conjugation. And so I'll denote that by the conjugate of alpha is alpha star, and it's going to satisfy some rules. And the fact that all of these algebras has, have this conjugation is really like what allows us to build the construction device between all of them. Okay, so the first rule that this has to satisfy is if you multiply something with its conjugate, you get a non-negative real number. So let's notice that inside of the real numbers, this is totally trivial. And that's because a conjugate is simply a. So you get a squared. So the conjugate of any real number is just a real number. And I guess I should say here that the conjugation, or exactly what the conjugation is as you move down the line, is defined via this construction. If you're looking to start your own domain, personal website, or online store, look no further than Squarespace. As a mathematician that's from the 22nd century, you heard that right, I'm a time traveler. Online presence is going to become a focal point for employers everywhere. We need to step up our website game. Too many math websites are stuck in the 1990s. Squarespace has tons of templates that offer awesome customization options with no coding required. Although you can access the code if you'd like to. For example, there's a very easy LaTeX integration that I have on my website, you know, for your equations and such. Whether you're already running an online store or have just begun your journey into web design, Squarespace has tools that you need to succeed. So what are you waiting for? Go check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Michael Penn to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So inside of the complex numbers, if you take a complex number a plus bi and multiply it to its conjugate a minus bi, you get a squared plus b squared. But since a and b are real numbers, a squared and b squared are positive real numbers, so that's a, well, I should say non-negative real number. And then in the quaternions, well, we have essentially the same kind of thing going on, just kind of with more, if you will. So here we have like a plus bi plus cj plus dk, times its conjugate. But there you just negate all of the imaginary parts. i, j, and k are thought to be all imaginary. So you have a minus b i minus c j minus d k. But now when we multiply this out, we kind of clearly get a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. That's because i squares to negative one, so does j and so does k. But then the minus sign is canceled given the fact that we've got alternating signs here. But then everything else cancels. And let's maybe look at that carefully by examining what happens to the stuff that's attached to B times C. Okay, so let's notice if we do BI 
times minus CJ, that'll give us something like this. We'll have minus BC times IJ. Okay, so let's maybe underline that to see where it's coming from. And then if we do maybe CJ times minus BI, we'll get minus BC times JI. Okay, great. But I think maybe it's well known that in the quaternions, I times J is K, whereas J times I is negative K. So since you pick up a minus sign, depending on the order of multiplication here, that means that both of those terms, well, well they'll cancel each other. So there, that's gone. And then essentially everything else disappears for the same sort of reason. And then inside of the octonians, something similar happens. So the octonians is an eight dimensional vector space over the real numbers. And I'll write it as being spanned by the number one and then all of the imaginary parts, which are E1 through E7. So I'll write this as plus B1 E1 plus B7 E7. And then if we multiply that by the conjugate, well, we negate all of the imaginary parts. So we have A minus B1 E1 minus all the way down to minus B7 E7. And well, if you know the multiplication table of the octonians, which we'll actually come up with by the end of the video, you'll see that if you multiply this all out, you get a squared plus b1 squared all the way up to b7 squared, which is clearly a non-negative integer, just based off the fact that all of those are non-negative integers. Okay, so let's look at some other properties satisfied by this conjugation before we look carefully at the construction. So here are three more properties of the conjugation, and we won't go through these quite as carefully as we went through the first one, but they follow very similarly. So if you add something to its conjugate, you get a real number. The multiplicative inverse of any element is given by one over its norm squared times its conjugate, so that's nice. And then if you take the conjugate of alpha times beta, you get the conjugate of beta times the conjugate of alpha. So it switches the order here. Okay, so now that we've got kind of an idea of some properties that tie all of these together, let's maybe look at the construction device. So the construction actually is quite simple when you look at it. So how does it go? Well, you're gonna start with any algebra from this sequence here. So of course, if you don't know any of the algebras to the right of the real numbers, you start with the real numbers and then you apply this construction over and over and over again. And then from that algebra that you've chosen, you form something which we'll call A prime. And as a set, A prime is A cross A, where that's the algebra that we chose. And then we're gonna endow that with a conjugation action as well as a product. And the conjugation will work like this. So the ordered pair A comma B conjugate is equal to A conjugate comma minus B. So let's recall that any algebra in this list has a conjugate already. And so we're defining this in terms of the conjugate of A. So the conjugate of A prime is being defined in terms of the conjugate of A. Okay, great. And then for the multiplication, we'll define A comma B times C comma D to be the following. So we have AC minus D star B and then DA plus BC star. And the order here matters because here to the right, we do not have commutativity. And I guess I should say, well, what's the motivation for this? Well, I think the motivation probably for this is the fact that the real numbers, the complex numbers and the quaternions already existed before this construction and Dixon was looking for some sort of unified construction that could take you from the real numbers to the complex numbers and also from the complex numbers to the quaternions. And that desired for this unified construction came up with these formulas down here. Okay, so anyway, let's start with an example. And we're actually gonna do three examples here. We're gonna do real numbers to complex numbers, complex numbers to quaternions, quaternions to octonions. And after that, the dimension is really too large for it to be that interesting. Okay, so that means here we're gonna start with R and then we're gonna define R prime as a set 
to be r cross r. Okay, good. And then, of course, we need to look at the conjugate inside of r prime. So here we'll have a, b star. Well, check it out over here. It's a star minus b. But a star inside of the real numbers is simply a. So this is simply a minus b. So it can't be simpler than that. Okay, and then what about the product? Well, what is the product? So we have a comma b times c comma d. Well, it's going to be equal to this stuff right here. But the good news in this step is, well, we can commute things. So they're in alphabetical order, so they look nicer. And we can also forget about the conjugates here because everything inside of the parentheses is happening in the real numbers and the conjugate of a real number is a real number. So this is gonna give us what? AC minus BD and then AD plus BC. So that's what we get for the product. And now let's notice that there are some nice properties of this thing. So in fact, we have a multiplicative identity and we can check that pretty easily. So notice that one zero times a b using this multiplication rule right here is simply a b. Okay, so we've got a multiplicative identity. I guess we should also check that we have commutativity because since we're going to the complex numbers which are known to be commutative, well, we should have commutativity here. So let's check that. So let's look at a comma b times c comma d. Notice that that is a c minus b d and then a d plus b c. But that's simply the same thing as c a minus d b and d a plus c b, which is c d times a b. So there's not much to the community, commutativity here. And now let's notice the really important thing that is different in the complex numbers, which is what r prime is supposed to be, and the real numbers is the fact that we have a square root of minus one. So I'll just put that as we have a, I'll just write square root of minus one like that. In fact, we'll have two of them, but they differ by a minus sign, so we don't really need to worry about that. So let's notice if we do 0, 1 times 0, 1 using this rule right here, we pretty clearly get negative 1, 0. But notice that we can maybe like factor the minus sign out, or maybe we don't even really need to worry about that. What we'll notice is that this is the negative of the multiplicative identity. And that's, of course, what we mean by having a square root of minus 1, because 1 is you know, indicative of the multiplicative identity. Okay, so now let's next show that this is so-called isomorphic to the complex numbers. And we'll do that by defining a map that starts at C and it ends at R prime. And what it does is it takes A plus BI and it sends it to the ordered pair AB. And then all we have to do is like a simple calculation so if we do phi of a plus b times c plus di, what do we get? Well, multiplying out complex numbers, that'll simply be phi of ac minus bd plus ad plus bc times i. Again, by the arithmetic of complex numbers. But then by our mapping rule here, that's simply the ordered pair AC minus BD and then AD plus BC. Oh, but that's exactly A comma B times C comma D by our multiplication rule. So AB and then CD. Oh, but that is phi of A plus BI times phi of C plus DI. And the fact that we started here and we were able to factor the product in both places means that, you know, this map preserves the multiplication. Of course, there are more things to check to show that these are isomorphic as, you know, R algebras, but, you know, this is maybe the most important thing. Okay, so we've done the first step. We've applied this construction and reliably built the complex numbers. 
Now let's look at how to make the quaternions. Okay, so now let's do the next construction. So we'll start with complex numbers and go to quaternions. So we'll start by defining C prime as a set to be C cross C. And then what is our multiplication? So our multiplication, A comma B, and then C comma D will simply be, well, it's this thing over here. But the conjugate of the complex numbers is non-trivial, so we have to keep the conjugate in there. But we do have commutativity of complex numbers, so we can put these things in alphabetical order, which I like to do. So this will be AC, and then minus BD star, comma, then we have AD plus BC star. So that's how our multiplication is defined inside of C prime. Okay, great. And then my conjugation, well, it's gonna be defined like that. So I'm not sure that I really need to write this down, but maybe we'll do it for something where we see the real and imaginary part within the ordered pair. So we could write that out here, but it'd be like a little bit too wordy, if you will. Okay, so let's take the element of C cross C, which is maybe given by u plus i v, and then x plus i y. So we wanna look at the conjugate of that. So this is what elements of C prime look like. Okay, great. So using this rule over here, we're gonna take the conjugate of the first part, so that'll be u minus i times v, that's the conjugate of this, and then we're gonna negate this. So it'll be minus x minus i y. Okay, so there we have that. And then we still have a multiplicative identity just like we did before. In fact, all of these things have multiplicative identities and you can see that one comma zero will be a multiplicative identity for all of these. And then we can also check that we have associativity in this case. So it's a bit of a slog, but it's maybe worth doing once in your life. So let's look at a comma b times c comma d and then times e comma f. So that's where we have the association with the first two left terms. So this is going to be equal to, well, let's write this multiplication out first. So that'll be ac minus bd star comma ad plus bc star. Just given our rule right here. And then we're multiplying this into e comma f. And then we've got to apply this rule again, but now on those two terms. And you'll see that you get the following object. Okay, so there you have it. There's a lot going on there. But notice the first entry is ACE minus B D star E minus A D F star minus B C star F star. And then we've got something kind of equally complicated for the second entry. But then you can notice that this is the same thing as A B times the following object. So we'll have CE minus DF star, and then CF plus DE star. Oh, but this object right here is exactly CD times EF. So here we have this is AB, and then CD times EF. But that's exactly what we needed to show that this thing was associative. Okay, so now let's look at some other properties. Okay, so we know that R, the real numbers, doesn't have any square roots of negative one. C has two, I and minus I. And now we'll show that C prime, constructed via this Cayley-Dixon construction, has, well, six, or really three square roots of minus one up to a minus sign. And you can check this via this multiplication rule right here. So notice if we take zero, one, times zero one, in other words, zero comma one squared, you will in fact get minus one zero, again by that multiplication rule. You can also check that if you take i zero times i zero, you will get negative one zero. I think that's like even easier to see. And then finally, if you take zero i and zero i, you will also get negative one zero. So there are three very different square roots of negative one. And now let's introduce a little bit of notation, helping us see that this really looks like the quaternions. 
So let's maybe set this fancy one equal to one zero. So that's like the multiplicative identity. Capital I equal to I zero. Capital J equal to zero comma one. And capital K equal to zero comma I. And now let's notice that these have all of the same properties that I, J, K have inside of the quaternions. And so we can in fact check that capital I squared is the same thing as capital J squared, which is the same thing as capital K squared, which is negative the multiplicative identity. You can also check that I times J times K is also negative the multiplicative identity. And those are in fact the only things we need to know that we have the quaternion algebra here. You could also, you know, take the rule that i times j is k, whereas j times i is negative k, but that actually follows from everything that we have on the board. And then let's maybe notice from this that c prime is the real span of the following vectors, or I guess they're not really vectors, but the following ordered pairs, which are defined via those four you know, symbols over there. So the one, the i, the j, and the k. And again, you can maybe do a multiplication table or you can set up an isomorphism like we did for complex numbers. It's just like a little bit more calculation and you can see that these are the same thing as Hamilton's quaternions. Another thing that you can check is if you take A1 plus B capital I plus C capital J plus D capital K and take its conjugate, well, as an ordered pair, this is simply A plus BI comma C plus DI. But if you recall, we took the conjugate of that before. In fact, it's on the board already. And this is a minus bi comma minus c minus di, which if we were to write out with those, you know, four symbols over there, we would have a times the multiplicative identity minus bi minus cj minus dk, which is what we should expect for taking the conjugate of a quaternion. Okay, so now let's do the next. Okay, so now let's do H to O. In other words, the quaternions to the octonions. So we're going to do the same thing that we did before. So we'll define H prime to be equal to H cross H. And here we're using maybe the classical way of writing H as everything of the form A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, like we did earlier, you know, much earlier, not in the previous construction. Okay, good. And then we have the same sort of product that we have over here. Well, it's exactly the same as this, but now the order matters because the preceding algebra is not commutative. So now let's quickly check that this thing is not associative. And well, it turns out that you have to carefully choose your elements of H cross H applying this rule because sometimes you do get associativity. So I found that if you choose these elements, it works out. So we'll do zero comma I multiplied into J comma zero. And then after that multiplied into K comma zero. Okay, so let's multiply the inside of these parentheses first. So using this rule over here, you'll see that we get zero comma minus K then we need to multiply that into k0. But then if you multiply that out, you'll see that you get 0 comma minus 1. Okay, so now let's do the other association. So we'll do 0 comma i and then j comma 0 multiplied into k comma 0. Okay, so that'll be 0 comma i and then multiplied into that will be jk comma 0, but jk is i, so this is i comma 0. And then if you do that product, you'll see that you get zero comma one. And so these are pretty clearly not the same. So we in fact don't have associativity here. So now let's talk about how to build the standard elements of the octonians from this construction. Okay, so we know that the octonians are eight dimensions over the real numbers. 
So that means we need to pick out eight elements of this space, which is quaternions cross quaternions. And they have to be maybe like linearly independent over real numbers. Okay, so let's start with the multiplicative identity, which is the same in all of these. And we'll call this like maybe blackboard bold one, just like we did before, and that'll be one zero. And then after that, we're gonna define E1 and E2. So we'll define E1 to be zero comma one, and then we'll define E2 to be I comma zero. Okay, good. And then from there, we need to define E1 times E2. And generally, that's set equal to E4. So let's define E4 to be E1 times E2. So what is that? So that's going to be 0, 1 times I, 0. But using this multiplication rule over here, you'll see that you get 0, minus I. Okay, nice. So let's put a little bit of a box around that. That's how we decided what E4 should be. So now let's maybe leave a gap for E3 and we'll say E4 must be equal to zero comma minus I. And then maybe we have to choose E3. So let's choose E3 to be J comma zero, kind of motivated by what E2 is. So E3, like I said, is J comma zero. And now we've got some other things to put together to build new elements. So let's define E5 to be E2 times E3. So let's see, that's I comma zero times J comma zero, but if you multiply that, you simply get K comma zero. So that'll be my E5. So let's write that here, so we get K comma zero. Now we still need E6 and E7. And like I said before, we're taking the standard definitions here, or we're working towards the standard multiplication table. So E7 can be defined to be, can be defined to be E1 times E3. So let's see, that's 0, 1 times J0. Okay, but if you make that multiplication, you'll see that you get zero comma minus J. Okay, so let's put that down here for E7. That's zero comma minus J, which means the only thing we have left to, to define is E6. And the standard way to define E6 is as E1 times E5. So if you're keeping track here, all we really need to needed to do was to choose E1, E2, and E3, and then define everything else in terms of those. Okay, so let's do the E1 times E5 multiplication. So that'll be 0, 1 times K, 0. But if you do that product, you'll see that you get 0, minus K. So what do we have here? So this is going to be 0, minus K. And those are all definitions here. But then also there are nice relationships between these that follow from the way that we did this. And you know, I'm not going to work all of them out, but if, for instance, you do E7 times E4, you'll get, well, by their definition, you'll have 0 minus j times 0 minus i. But if you do that product, again, using this rule over here, you get k comma 0, which is equal to e5. And there are a ton of others of those. And in fact, all of them can be described via a nice diagram, which we'll end the video with. So here's a nice picture that will totally describe the multiplication rules between all of these. So you might wonder how to read this. Well, if your multiplication is going in the direction of the arrows, then you pick up a minus sign. So for instance, E6 times E3 is E4 because it's in the direction of the arrows but E4 times E3 is negative E6. So that's because it's in the reverse direction of the arrows. But there's some loops here that you can't see. For instance, there's a loop happening at all of the edges. So E2 times E6 loops around to positive E7. Whereas like E2 times E7 loops around to negative E6 because it's in the opposite direction. And I guess one thing that I didn't explicitly say, but is kind of an undercurrent, is that all of these things square to, 
Well, the multiplicative identity, which I've written as minus one, because that's the typical way of writing in the octonians. Although in this h cross h, it would be this fancy one. Okay, so that's the Cayley-Dixon construction. So there's a little bit of a tweak of it in this multiplication rule that forms the so-called split quaternions. Well, actually the split complex numbers and the split quaternions and the split octonians and so on and so forth. Maybe post in the comments if you'd like a video about maybe the split octonians are particularly interesting because they have a nice matrix representation. And if you haven't subscribed yet, consider subscribing. It would really help the channel out. And that's a good place to stop.